get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm a founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Before I introduce today's guest, which, I, you know, Javon, I have created this podcast for this very day, for Javon. I mean, you'll see why. This, this is why it's called Inspired Insider, is because I love talking about stories that are the challenges, the what builds our character, what builds us as individuals. And this story today is just that. You know, if I always like to point people to other podcast episodes to check out. Um, I had the founder of P90X, Tony Horton. What I love, Javon, about that story is like, he did, we, yes, he's generated tons of success, but what people don't know about him is he drove cross country with basically no money all the way to California. And the way he made food and rent money was he was a street mime. So he did street miming, put a hat on the street, and that's how he made his food and rent money when he was up and coming. And um, Julie Clark of uh, baby Einstein grew her company from with five employees to $20 million in a very short period of time selling to Disney. But what was impressive to me was she beat cancer twice. She had cancer throughout that time. And just tr- those tremendous stories are don't get told. And there's so many more. So go to inspiredinsider.com and, and check out more episodes. And this episode, before I introduce Javon McCormick of Scribe Media, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And for me, Javon, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships. How do I profile the people and companies I admire on my podcast to give to them? And that's why I've been podcasting for over a decade. I've I've never stopped doing it. It's the best thing I've ever done. And, um, you know, if you are encouraged, you should be encouraged to, if you have a business, you should have a podcast, in my opinion, you'll go to rise25.com, check out and learn more. And, you know, ultimately from the, what inspired me to podcast, and I don't tell this story all the time, which, um, I, I started telling it, I don't know, maybe like nine years ago or so is because my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And they were the only members of their family to survive. And his legacy lives on because of an interview, because the Holocaust Foundation didn't interview with him. And so now my kids can watch it. My grandkids can watch it. My great grandkids can watch it. And it's going to be similar with Javon's story and also with Scribe Media, actually, because what Scribe Media does is helps people tell their story so it lives on. Their legacy lives on through the books that they create. And so without further ado, let me introduce um, Javon McCormick. And it's a really heart-wrenching story. I encourage everyone. He's given a talk um, several times that you should listen to, but he was born, just a little bit of background, was born um, the mixed race son of a drug dealing pimp father and orphan single mother on welfare. And he was raised in the slums of Dayton, Ohio, suffered incredible abuse and racism. Um, I don't know how you tell your story, John, honestly, without crying or breaking down. You you say it with some, such composure when you're doing it, because like I when I wa- I watch it um, probably almost 10 times now, legitimately. And, you know, it, I get emotional when I hear your story. And, you know, he had multiple stints in the juvenile justice system, barely graduated high school, has no college degree started scrubbing toilets, hustled and worked his way into the banking and mortgage industry, did really well there until we know what happened in the mortgage industry. It fell apart. He lost his job, lost his money, and had to borrow from his friends to make rent. But you know, he is resilient. He springboarded, made millions in the stock market, eventually became president of two multi-million dollar companies, a software company, now is a president and CEO of Scribe Media, which I mentioned is a publishing company that helps people write and publish and market their books. They've worked with over 1,900 authors, including David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me, that sold over 2 million copies. And Javon has a book, which you should check out. I got there. How I Overcame Racism, Poverty, and Abuse to Achieve the American Dream. Javon, this is when I stopped talking, but it just, you know, (laughs) thank you for joining me. My man, how are you, sir? I am great. I am great. I'm glad to have you. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted to, I'm like, where do I start with this story? and I kind of want to start on a plane ride. I think, you know, you never wanted to share your story. 
nah. with anyone no. and you wanted to keep it a secret. And what changed on that plane ride? Uh, you know, I, I had my, my children at the time. I had two at the time of that plane ride and I hit turbulence and it really jumped out to me that, wow, if something happened to me, my children would not know where I came from in, in my background. So when I got off the plane, my, my whole mission was, okay, how can I put my story in a book? And, and, and here, here's what, what's key to this. I just wanted to put it in a book. I didn't want to make it public. I just needed a book, much like the video of your grandfather. I just needed something to where my great, great, great grandchildren would know, okay, here's our origin story, because I don't have one. Like I said, my mother was uh, was an orphan. I don't know where my last name comes from still to this day. Uh, you, you nailed it. My, my father was a um, black pimp and drug dealer. He fathered 23 children. And I wanted that that to my my kids to know those things. So that became the the mission. How do I put my story in a book? And I only wanted five copies, man. I did not want this book to be public. There were things in there. That I'm like, oh man, if this goes public, a lot of people are gonna be like, wait a minute. I thought he had a degree. Hold on. I thought he was Mexican. And so I I did not want that book to go public, but here we are. So what changed? So you, you meet with Tucker yeah. and what happens? So I was, I'll, I'll give you the story. I was the president of a software company and we had scaled that company. I started off as the lowest paid person in that software company. I was employee number 13. I used to sit on a fold out metal chair in a storage closet. And uh, within two, two and a half years, I became the president of the company Long story short, we scaled that company from that storage closet to end up having offices in Austin, Houston, Dallas, and Monterey, Mexico. At that time, it was about five years I was there. That's when it hit me, man, I got I to gotta write this book for my kids. I reached out to my, my uh, network and got introduced to, to Tucker Max. And so I got to give you the story behind this, man. So the, the way I got introduced was... You know the standard BS. There's always a story behind. Always the, a story, with Tucker man. Max. Yeah, yes, yeah. And, and so uh, um, the introduction email goes as all of them do. Hey, uh, Tucker, this is JT. And JT, this is Tucker. Blah blah blah. And then in a second email, uh, Jason emails me and says, "Hey, that's the real Tucker Max." Well, I didn't know who Tucker Max was. So I emailed Jeremy back, smart ass. I went, well, hey, I'm the real JT McCormick. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> and so then I Googled Tucker and I was like, oh, wow. And so he comes over to my office. We're sitting in this massive conference room. I'm telling him my story. I, I say to Tucker, now keep in mind, you know, Tucker sold damn near 5 million copies of, of his books throughout his career. Tucker sitting across from me and I go, Hey man, I, I don't ever want to sell a copy of a book. I only need five copies. And Tucker looks and he goes, I've never heard anyone say they don't want to sell any copies. I go, I'm not doing it for fame. I'm doing this for my kids. And he said, okay, I tell you what, will you give me feedback on our company as you go through our process? At the time, Tucker and Zach, the two co-founders, their company was only about 13 months old. So I said, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll give you feedback. He goes, man, you've built a great company here talking about the software company. And I said to him, I go, look, no one person ever builds a great company. It takes a, an incredible team of people to build a great company. I said, so I'll give you feedback. On the first email I got from uh, the, the company, I called up Tucker. I said, hey, do you still want this feedback? He says, yes. I said, okay, man, I swing hard. And he goes, go for it. I go, okay, this is good. This is good stop doing this. What the hell were you thinking? And this is dumb as shit. <laughs> and he goes, you got all that from an email. And I go, yes. He said, Hey, would you sit on our advisory board? I'm like, yeah, okay. Why not? One thing I, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. Oh, no, so, go ahead. I, I want to get a little granular with that. I was like, what, what did you see that needed improvement? What were you seeing through the email that needed improvement in the company? Um, it, it, it was just the, the communication. What, what they didn't realize was they figured out how to deliver a great quality book. What they hadn't figured out was the author experience from the time that they engage to the time that book is published. 
And what you don't want to have happen is someone gets to the end of the process and they go, oh my God, your book is so great. It's beautiful. The content's phenomenal. How was your publisher? What you don't want to have happen is they, oh, your pub- publisher was horrible. They sucked. They yeah. were, and, and so I expressed right. to them, I go, man, you are in the services and product business. Many people don't realize that, yes, some companies are a service company. Some companies are a product company. And Jeremy, what I mean by that, here's a great example of this. If you and I go right now this afternoon to the Apple store and we want the new iPhone, if the customer service rep is rude to us, we, you know, yeah, we care. But at the same time, I'm there for that iPhone. So be it, be it that you're nice to me, be it that you're rude to me, I'm coming out of there with the product the iPhone. Well, we don't have that luxury. We're working with authors for nine, 12 months. It's, it's intimate. It's a relationship. So we have to provide a phenomenal author experience and an incredible book. So we're in the services and the product business. And, and that's the piece that, that was really missing. They always had quality coming out of the, the company uh, in, in, you know, in their 13 months, but they were missing the, the experience factor. Yeah. I mean, it was a friend was telling me the other day, they had worked on like construction on their house. It looks beautiful, but they yep. were, it was the worst experience of their life. Right. I, so I it, give everyone they, that example. Yeah. So I totally get it. So you talk to Tucker, you give him feedback on this email. So yeah. you're still in the mindset of I'm going to do five bucks here when you do the, when yeah, you do the it. book. Okay. I only want, I only want five copies of, the, okay. of this book. And so again, fast forward, then Zach and Tucker invited me to a, a quote unquote executive meeting. And I went to this executive meeting. I'm like, man, this is broke. And, <laughs> and so uh, I, I didn't give any direction. I just asked questions. I sat in the meeting. I asked questions. That was it. Fast forward, um, Tucker and Zach invited me to Starbucks. We sat down and they said, hey, if we give you a ton of equity, would you come be the CEO of the company? And it was in that moment I said to myself, wow, I'm the president of a software company right now and I can't write code. And now I can be the CEO of a publishing company and I can't spell and can't tell you an adverb from an adjective. And I remember thinking to myself, God bless America. And I said, yeah, man, I'm in, let's do it. So, and here we are, what, five, almost six years later and and here we are. So at what point do you decide to release the book out to the public? As we were doing the book, because I, obviously I became the CEO and I was working here at that point, and I was able to delay the book uh, by by way of saying, "Oh, you know, I'm 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 busy scaling the company, and so we had to put the book off to the side." Um, but I, through a lot of conversation, a lot it's of a big support, decision, you know, oh, man, oh. it's a really big decision. You know, a lot of conversations, a lot of support, a lot of encouragement. Um, I, I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll release the book. And matter, matter of fact, I'll even share this with you. I remember we had like a little book launch party uh, at a, a, a bookstore here in, in Austin. And we're getting ready. And my wife says to me, she goes, oh my God, this is so, so exciting. Are you excited? And I go, no. And she goes, why? Did she read the book beforehand? I mean, well, I she knew all she's... the stories. Yeah, I mean, she, yeah. she knew my background. Yeah. Uh, she was one, one of the very few people in the world who actually knew all the, the, the actual stories. Um, but I explained to her, I said, think of this. And I told her, I said, everything that you've shared with people, everything that people thought you were, now is going to be out into the world and people are going to say, what? Oh, I thought he had an MBA. Hey, wait a minute. I thought he was Puerto Rican. Wait, and, and I said, all of my secrets, all the things, you know, I said the, the stuff about my, my baby sister. I don't know if we'll, we'll get into that. Um, I said the, the fact that my dad had 23 kids. No one knew that. No one knew my dad was a pimp and had 23 kids. No one knew that. No one knew. No one on earth other than me, my mother and my wife knew that I didn't know where my last name came from. I said, now all of this is going to be out there and be public. And I said, no, I'm not excited about that. And she goes, OK, that makes sense. <laughs> You know, when I talk to Tucker and I encourage people to check out that interview as well, you know, he was a different person, obviously, in college than he was when he met his wife. And he did a lot of self work 
to get to that point where he, I think he said, you know, I had to be a different person. I knew I didn't need to be a different person for that person. Once I met them to be my wife for when you met your wife, at what point do you share what, you know, that you probably haven't shared with anyone, any of this? Um, you know, I'll, I'll back up a bit before there. So, cause you, you talked about it, uh, somewhat, um, 2007, when I lost all my money, I had made some, I had made some, some money, some, some good money, mil, million dollars. And, and even then, uh, in my investing accounts, there was a lot of people that did not know that I had made a, a million dollars. Didn't want you to know who I was. Didn't want you to know I had that money. And I remember when I lost all the money. There was a night I went to the convenience store to put gas in my car because I had no money and I had to, I had to dig into my, my change container and I got $10 of quarters out of it. I went over to the gas station, 1030 a night, never forget this. And I walked into the, the attendant and I put my quarters on the table and I said, could I have $10 on pump number seven? And I remember walking back to the car and I said to myself, damn, how did I get myself back here again? But I, I, I literally, I smiled, you know, because I already knew what it was like to be poor. So I wasn't scared of being poor. I, I was disappointed in myself for, for putting myself back in there. But I, I, I knew poor so well that I had a conversation with poor. I was like, hey, poor, good to see you again, man. Didn't think I was going to see you again, but hey, I'm back. <laughs> so uh, because I knew what poor was. So I wasn't afraid of poor. I knew what that looked like. What hit me the most is when I got back to my little apartment, I stood in the mirror and I realized, wow, okay, so I had a lot of money. I lost a lot of money, but I'm the same person. The money didn't change me. And when it hit me, I was like, oh my God, my character is horrible. I can't hold a relationship. No one's ever really known who I, who I am. You know, in, in relationships, I was never 100%. I, I, you never really knew all of me. I didn't want you to. Um, and I was a monster in relationships. And, and I had to look in the mirror, have an out loud conversation and say, wow, you're just like the person you didn't want to be like your dad. And that, that really hit me that, okay, you taught yourself with, with no college degree, with only a GED, how to navigate the business world. You taught yourself how to make money in stocks. You never taught yourself how to have a relationship. And, and I don't blame anyone for this. So the, the, I, cause I don't do this victimhood shit and oh, my parents were divorced and I come from a broken, ah, get out of here with that. Uh, and, and so, but here's, here's the fact. I did not know what a, a healthy relationship was supposed to look like because I never saw one. You know, I, I saw my dad. I, I saw my mom. Neither were in healthy relationships. So I did yeah, not. Typically, have a, people probably model what they know. Right. Right. Oh, oh Jeremy, you got to let me go off on a tangent on this. Go ahead. So, so here, here's what's interesting about what you just said. People model what they see. In my opinion, this is why the middle class is so big. Because if you come from a home, a two-parent home, three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath house, you go on a two-week vacation each year, maybe your mom and dad both work, maybe you just have a one working home, whatever the case may be, you tend to model what you grew up in. If, if your parents were, were Jewish or, you're, you're, or, or Catholic or, or Methodist, whatever, you tend to become what you grew up around. I didn't grow up around any structure or anything. And, and I even say this, I actually feel that that benefited me greatly because the middle class, there's a, there's a standard. There's the three bedroom, two and a half bath. Okay, get a good college degree, get a good job, work there 30 years. I didn't have that. What I had was dirt poor, have pulled uh, food out of their trash cans, have been left alone with my siblings, heroin addicts, drug addicts, pimps. That's where I came from. And at 10 years old, when my dad drove me through River Oaks in Houston, Texas, the, the, the exclusive neighborhood, all I saw was, wait a minute, I didn't even know this existed. So I saw five, 10, $25 million homes that became my level of, okay, I want that. Hmm. So there was, to your point was the model of what you see has a very big effect on what you become. Well, I didn't have a, a, a model other than, you know, my, my, my dad did, did shitty things. 
I never saw my mom in a good, healthy relationship. So I didn't know how to have one. So that became then, how do I teach myself to have a good relationship? And so when I finally, uh, and, and it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> so, but when I finally met my wife, that was my commitment. I said, okay, I got to let her know who I am up front. She's either going to accept me for who I am or the shit ain't going to work. And thank God she accepted me for who I am. For John, thanks for sharing that. Do you seek outside help for that when you realize that? Or, I mean, you're a, you're an avid learner in general. What do you, what do you do to say, okay, I'm not sure what to do here. I don't have a model for this. No, I did. I didn't seek outside help. I, no. I started paying attention. I started uh, just, just like I did everything else. You know, there, there was no, there was no model for me to learn about stocks. There was, but, but where I learned was paying attention, reading, observing the, the gift that was given to me in the chaos that I grew up in as a kid was the gift of observation. You're constantly looking, trying to avoid chaos, trying to avoid the, the next time you'll be sexually molested, trying to avoid getting an, an, an ass beating or, or jumped by a group of kids. Whatever. So you're, you're, you're constantly paying attention to the room. Who's doing what? Why are they saying that? Um, and that I, I took those lessons into mm. adult, adulthood and they, they served me well. Was your dad, when he drove through that River Oaks, was it for a specific reason to show you the homes or was no. it just, no, we were just, I, I actually, he never said a word. I actually believe he was driving through the neighborhood so he could see those houses just so happened as a byproduct. There was a son sitting in the car paying attention and that became the, the, the driver of really, oh man. I, I'm going to have one of those one day. And, and, and I'm, I'm incredibly blessed to be able to say, you know, now I, I live in a gated community. There's a pond in the backyard. My kids go to private Christian school. So, um, and, and I have to give my dad a lot of credit that 10 year old that sat there and we got to drive through that neighborhood, man, game changing. Uh, uh, Jeremy, I got to share this with you, man. Uh, last Christmas, we went to, we were in Houston. I have four kids now. So we're in Houston. And like I said, ultra exclusive neighborhood. I mean, you've got uh, houses in, in River Oaks. They spend $100,000 on Christmas lights, just decorating their homes. So there's uh, horse and carriage rides you can take through the, wow. through the neighborhood to see the houses. And it, it's, it is not cheap to, to do the <laughs> horse and carriage ride, man. <laughs> And, and so here I was with my family, my four kids, and we're on this horse and carriage ride and we're riding through River Oaks, looking at the Christmas lights. And man, I, I, I'll man up. I, I cried. I was yeah. like, wow, look at that this. is emotional. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a moment, man. I'm like the very houses, some of them that I looked at when I was a kid. Here I am now with my kids. Um and while we don't live in River Oaks, they, they live that lifestyle. And, and here I was with my kids going back through horse and carriage. And, and man, that was, that was a moment. There's a, there's a part of your story that, that strikes me. And I, any parent can relate to this where you're kind of just left. I think you were nine or something left with a six month old baby. Um, and if any parent, you know, has, I remember taking, leaving the hospital um, with the newborn, our newborn baby, and you feel helpless. Like you have no idea what to do. Okay. And you're like, I have to be responsible for this thing. I need to keep this thing alive. <laughs> and that's when people are in their thirties. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I heard that part of your story. I'm like, I, I have no idea what I would have done in that. I, I didn't even know what to do when I was in my thirties with a newborn baby. So Take me back. You're kind of left just alone to take care of this baby. So, man, um, to make it even worse, I'll give you the, give you the whole yeah. story behind that is I ended up with my dad in Houston, Texas at a hourly rate motel. Motel. And we all know what goes down at an hourly rate motel. <laughs> the way I even got there was my mother was facing uh, – welfare fraud. She was facing uh, having to go to prison for welfare fraud. So she sent me to Houston. I was nine years old. She sent me to Houston to, to be with, with my dad, why she tried to get everything taken care of and, and not go to prison. 
So I get to Houston. I show up at the, the I remember it's the Surrey House Motel. Um, and my dad, his prostitute, and my six-month-old half-sister were there. Two days after I got there, my dad and the prostitute say, hey, we'll be back. And they left. They left me with my, my baby sister. Of course, as all babies do, my baby sister starts crying like five minutes after they leave. And I'm standing there and I'm nine years old. I have no clue what to do. So I pick her up. I, I'm trying to console her. I'm like, Shh, it's okay. It's okay. And she's still crying. And, and you know, you start going into panic mode. I, I'm like, um, I don't know how to make a bottle. I don't know how to change a diaper. What do babies eat? Um, you know, all you know, a million and one things are going through your head because you don't know what to do. And I remember, man, it, uh, there, there, there's two pieces to this. Um, damn. Jeremy, you, 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 you made me think of something, man. I remember in that moment, actually, I've never, I've never said this on a podcast. I was so confused and I was angry at the same time. And this actually may explain the, the other piece of this. I remember when I used to be sexually molested by one of my dad's prostitutes, she used to force me to perform oral sex on her at the ages of six, seven, eight years old. And I remember when I didn't do it right, she would slap me in the face, punch me in the head and say, do it right. Some people may not like this joke. This is how I've dealt with it. It's in the past. I, I find laughter in things. <laughs> man, I'm a, I'm a grown ass man. And I know grown adults that don't know what do it right means. So it's six, seven, eight years old. What the hell does do it right means? Uh, what does that mean? And so, uh, but I remember at times, seven, eight years old, thinking to myself, okay, I am never going to be in a position where I don't know what to do. And I made that decision seven, eight years old. Like, hey, I always got to know what to do. I always got to know what to do. So I'm not in this, this position. So let's jump back over to the motel. Here I am. I'm nine years old. I'm holding my baby sister. And I don't know what to do, man. And I remember the, the feeling of helplessness. And not knowing what to do and, and stress, just stress the hell out. 20 minutes goes by. She's still crying. Man, I throw my baby sister uh, uh, across the room. And I, I remember when she left my fingertips, just instantly thinking, what the hell? What kind of monster throws a, a baby? And, and man, to, to this day, by, by the grace of God, my, my baby sister landed on the couch and I went over, she's screaming. I went over, I picked her up and I'm trying to console her. I'm just, you know, bawling. I'm crying now. And, and I don't know what to do, man. I'm just lost. Uh, first time I had been away from my mom for more than a weekend. I want to go home. Um, and I, I remember then the prostitute walks in and she tells me to get out and it, because she's got a man with her and it's time to time to do business. And she tells me to get out and she tells me to take my baby sister with me. She's still crying. We walk out. She's in a diaper. Um, we're in Houston, Texas in July, sweltering heat, uh, humidity, you know, all just off the charts. And I'm walking around that nasty parking lot with my baby sister. She's crying. I'm crying. I'm, 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 I remember I was looking for shade to try to keep her at least in, in the shade because we were sweating. But I just wanted to go home, man. It's, it's, that's the, the thing that kept, I wanted to go home. I wanted my mom. I didn't know what the hell was going on. How did I end up here? I'm like nine years old. What, what the hell is going on in life? But yeah, that was, that was, that was a tough moment, man. And, and it would, like I said, it wasn't until this moment it clicked for me. I, I think a lot of that frustration of why I, I threw my baby sister was because there I was again, not knowing what to do. Yeah. yeah. For you is in those moments, you always, you wanted something you could control and yeah. you always wanted to know what to do. Um, I'm just curious, why do you think, you know, with that, all of that, it's just, just heart wrenching. I mean, that's just one of a zillion stories. If anyone reads your book, 
you know, people think that that's just like the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately, with what happened, you know, in your childhood. How do you think you turned out the way you did seeing the model? Because I, I could see easily because you, you started to, um, you know, get into the juvenile system a little bit. But what, what was it in your mentality or seeing all this around you and you kind of took the opposite route? Man, I, I had a couple of things that really worked out in, in my favor. Some people would look at them as um, negatives. You know, I, I, here's something I always hear, Jeremy, that really gets under my skin. People will say to me, oh, my God, you had every reason to fail. You had every reason not to be not to succeed. People would totally understand if, if you were a victim. I wouldn't. You know, I, I, I tell people if you if you get through my background, I had every reason to succeed because if you can make it through that shit, the rest of this is pretty easy. Um, and so I've never, that, that was one thing. I always tried to take lessons from, even as a kid, how do I learn? How do I, how do I figure this out? How do I, we do things different? Um, and then along the way, I had some, some great uh, opportunities. Here's one. I, I was in juvenile, you nailed it. I was in juvenile prison three times. And, and I'm, I, if I had a regret on that book was that I put juvenile detention. You know, man, I, I got to call it what it is. It's juvenile prison. It's prison for kids. I remember being in solitary confinement and, mm. and not knowing if someone was ever going to come back and get me. And you want to talk about a mental mind shift as a kid to be in solitary confinement 23 hours and wonder if somebody's going to come back and get you and, and, and knowing your dad's in England, your mother's in Texas, you're in Dayton, Ohio, and no one knows you're in there. And it's just a, a, a complete mental, uh, you're playing with your, your head all, the whole time having conversations. But um, the third time I was getting out of uh, juvenile prison, this huge, huge um, corrections officer, he gets on his knee, Jeremy, <laughs> and he gets right in my face and he says, son, come here. He said, if you ever come back here again, you're going to man prison. Jeremy, I'll be 50 years old this year, man. I don't know what it is about man prison. It doesn't sound right. I do not want to go to man prison. <laughs> it just doesn't sound like man prison doesn't sound like things are going down the way I want them to. So uh, that was a, a big. You moment. decided you weren't going back. Yeah, I decide, oh, I am not going to man prison. That doesn't sound good. I don't want to know what it is. And that corrections officer kept me from ever going back to, to juvenile prison because mm. now it was the fear of the unknown. Like, oh, I don't want to know what that is. And then I, I also have to be respectful as well. Um, one of the, after I had slept on benches at 13 because uh, I was homeless, didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, my uncle Bobby decided to, to uh, take me in for whatever reason. And, and keep in mind, my dad had 23 kids, man, by the grace of God, he took me in. And, and I guess he just got tired of watching me getting bounced around and, and whatever, but he took me in. And I got to live with my uncle Bobby for about uh, 18 months. And as a, a 13, 14 year old kid, man, that was, especially for a boy, I got to see structure, discipline, routine, consistency. Uh, that was my first introduction to God. You know, my uncle Bobby was was a uh, Jehovah Witness, and you know we had Bible study on Tuesday, Bible study on Thursday, church on on Sunday, and it, relentless. Everything was was be on time, keep your word, say what you mean, follow through, and I learned all that in in a in a fifteen to eighteen month time frame from from Uncle Bobby. So that was a big one for me. Um, yeah, th th that's everything for me was just a belief that there was something more, but I, I, I'd have to trace it all back to driving through River Oaks and being able to see that there was something different. Yeah, I want to do a, a bit of a highlight reel over your the jobs for a second. Um, but before we do that, there's one part of the whole story that kind of baffles me, okay? And it's the it's the um, part when you're when you're in the supermarket. Oh man, 
so it's it's funny, man. If you if you ask me, top three top three to five life lessons. Like I said, I'll be fifty in September. Top three to five life lessons. This is one of the top top lessons that that I, I took from my dad. Um, so my dad uh, had me one weekend on one of those rare occasions. He actually followed through and picked me up. We're in the grocery store. No clue why. You know, I've been asked, well, why were you in the grocery store? I don't know. It was my dad. You never knew what you were doing with my dad. So we're in the grocery store. And I was a shy kid. You know, I lived with my mom and, and my mom was very protective of me. She didn't have any family. So I, I literally was like a human baby doll to, to my mom. Uh, and. So when I'm with my dad, you know, my dad was rough. It was, you know, it was chaotic. You know, my dad was a pimp. You know, it wasn't like my my dad was this nice, gentle, get on the floor, cuddle with you, man. My dad was a pimp. So I was shy. We're walking down the aisle. I remember the frozen food section and this little girl walks by. And I'm eight years old. And she says, hi, Javon. And I don't say anything. I put my head down. I'm shy. And man, I feel this massive blow to the back of my head. My face hits the ground. My nose is bleeding. My lip is split. Uh, and then I'm pinned up against the frozen food section door with a with a form in my neck. And my dad's like two inches from my face. And, and he says to me, I don't care who it is. You be kind, show respect, and say hello to everyone. Here's the damnedest thing, Jeremy. We had literally just finished collecting money from prostitutes, <laughs> but the lesson stuck. The lesson stuck. And to this, man, I say hello to everyone. I don't care if I'm walking uh, through a hotel and going to my room and somebody else is walking by and they've got their head down. I'm saying hello. And, and that it came from that lesson. And that was one of the most impactful lessons that, it, like I said, top three to five from my, my childhood was that lesson. Yeah. When you started to tell that story, when I was watching it, that was the last thing I was expecting that he was going to say when you're yeah. pinned up against, pinned up against that. So that's, it's wild. Um, yeah. He, they, but, but here, here's what's, what's key to that. Um, I say to so many people, yes, it was chaotic. Yes, it was rough. Yes, it was harsh. But there, there are truly, I look at my lessons from life. I look at it just like diamonds. If anyone knows anything about having to mine a diamond, it's hard as hell to go find mining for, for diamonds. Um, that's how I look at my, my childhood. There are some diamonds back there as far as the lessons go. And, and you had to do some serious mining to, to find those lessons. And, and I've taken some of those lessons and, and turned them into diamonds. I want to hear the trajectory of your career a bit, just in fast forward. And then, because I want to talk about how you've helped Scribe Media navigate. Um, but one of the, the, the first job, and, and it's, I don't know what you call it. Irony. The first place that you were scrubbing toilets <laughs> and what it was called. I thought you were making it up. Like when I first hear, I'm like, there's no way th this is the name of the place. But start there and then fast forward me kind of through your professional career a little bit. All right, man. So um, when I was a kid and you're poor, the laughter is really all you have. And so my mom and I would always joke that we were so poor, we couldn't afford the O and the R. We were just po. So after I get my GED, I get home and I, I walk in. I'm like, mom, we got my GED, whatever. And she says, great. You've got two weeks to get a job or get out. I was like, damn. And so we're in San Antonio at the time now. And so the next day I go looking for a job. The first place I stopped, because it was just the first place that, that I passed to go start looking for jobs. I could have gone to Kroger. I could have gone to Walmart, Target, uh, McDonald's, Burger King, you name it. I have so many places I could have gone. Nope. First place I got a job was Po Folks. Can't make that up, man. I, I, the, oh, my only regret is that I don't still have a pay stub that actually <laughs> showed I worked there. But yes, my first job was at Po Folks. And what was Po Folks? Is it a restaurant? It was a restaurant. It, it was, uh, think, 
think uh, um think like a cracker barrel something al- okay. along those lines yeah okay and so uh, that that was like, my... who wanted to, who wanted to name a restaurant that <laughs> Who knows, man? I know. I know. They it, should it have had you popular. on the executive team on that on that decision. <laughs> uh, but my 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 first job there was uh, I was a busboy and I was responsible for cleaning the toilets from the night before. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, you come in the next morning and the toilets are filthy, you know, because they're from the, the the night crowd, whatever. And I remember standing there. And and and, and Jeremy, here's a, here's another one. Um, I, I got to give my dad credit for this. I'm standing there, I'm looking at the toilets, and I said to myself, okay, if this is my job, I'm going to have the cleanest toilets in San Antonio. I'm going to have the cleanest toilets in Texas. And I remember saying that. Where that came from, my dad, when I was a kid, had two or three of my brothers with me that day, and he told us, he said, look, I don't care what you do in life. Whatever you do in life, be the best at it. If you're going to sweep the streets, be the best street sweeper. Now, he could have given us a little something more to aspire to, but that was the lesson I, I got. It was, okay, be the best. And so I had the cleanest toilets. And so everything I did from that point on, I was trying to be the best at it. You know, when I cleaned the tables, uh, not only did I clean the tables, I wiped down the salt shaker and, and the pepper shaker. Not only that, I would make sure that the chairs didn't have any crumbs in them. Uh, so I, I always want to do it more, do it better, be the best. Um. Fast forward, um, man, I got to tell you this. So there were, there were two people that would come in there and eat lunch every day, every day. And so for like three months, I didn't even know this. For three months, they would watch me do my job. And then one day they said, hey, you should come work for us. Like, what, what do you do? And they owned a, I don't know, a knickknack type Fabergé egg candle place in the mall. Now, you know, I'm, I'm 18 years old. This is back when the mall was the hotness, the place to be. And they said, we'll teach you how to make candles. You'll stand in front of the window at the mall and you'll make candles. I'm like, oh my God, count me in. You're like, you're going to pay me more. Teach me to make candles at the mall. I'm like, oh, sign me up. And so that was, uh, I, I went there and I wasn't there that long because then my mom uh, got me a job at the um, 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 insurance company she was working at. And my first job at the insurance company, I got the job, I was the mail boy. I pushed a cart, uh, I delivered mail, I was a filer. And, and, and so this is actually where I learned how to trade stocks was at the uh, insurance company. I'm pushing my cart by one day and I go by a sign and it says free lunch and learn 401k. All I saw was free lunch. And lunch. <laughs> I'm like, okay, like I see free lunch. That's yeah, free I lunch. I, yeah. I'm in. You know, it could, it could, the, the, it could have been about the female reproductive system. <laughs> I'm, I am in. Count me in for this. And so I, I'm pushing my car to go by, and uh, a lady walks by, and I, I say to her, I said, um, excuse me, can you tell me where conference room 401k is? And she laughs and she goes, no, 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 no. That's what the conference, the, the lunch and learn is about 401k. I mean, I thought it was a conference room. I, I didn't even know. So I go to this conference, the, the, the free lunch and learn, man, I heard two of the greatest words in, in history, compound interest. And I was hooked. Everything from that point on, I wanted to read about stocks. I wanted to know about trading how, how does, I was just like blown away. I'm like, wait a minute, you can take a hundred dollars and turn it into two and two into five and so on and so forth. And like, this is legal. And so I, I, I was hooked, man. And that's where, where I learned it from, uh, the insurance company. I went into payday loans, uh, moved to Portland, Oregon. I was there for three years. Um, got to learn everything about high interest payday loans. That's a, it's a dirty business. Um, but it helps out some people as well. Um, I left payday loans, got into mortgage, learned everything in mortgages from the loan processor to loan officer to account executive to uh, all the way up to, to selling package loan CDOs and, and everything in between. Got to share this part with you because uh, this part didn't make the book. When we had my book launch party, because uh, I got to work at Countrywide Home Loans during my, my mortgage ten, tenure, which 
Countrywide Home Loans was the largest home lender in the world at one point. And we're at the my book launch party. And a lady comes up to me and she goes, hey, I read your book. It was great. She said, uh, particularly, I, I enjoyed the part about you spoke fondly of Countrywide Home Loans. And I go into, I'm like, oh, I love that place. I, I loved it. It was so cool. Angelo Mazzello started that company on a, on a fold-out card table in California. And he turned into the law. And I just went on and on and on. And, and then as soon as I stopped, she goes, Angelo Mazzello is my grandfather. And I'm like, no. And she's like, yes. She texts him right there. Mm. He responds. Fast forward. Uh, she actually arranged. I got to fly out to California at Angelo Mazzello's house and meet him face to face. And wow. I spent the day with, man, that was awesome. Because for whatever anybody wants to say about the mortgage industry and Angelo Mazzello, it wasn't just Angelo Mazzello that the mortgage industry <laughs> collapsed. It, it was so many different players and, and consumers as well. It wasn't just the banks. It was people taking out the damn loans as well. Um, but it was a highlight for me to, to be able to meet Angelo. So then uh, credit market crashed. Um, and then uh, from there, I was the... Uh, as I said, I was the lowest paid person sales guy at, at a software company, sat on the fold out metal chair, became the president. Then from there, here I am at, at Scribe. Amazing. Amazing, Javon. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I, thought, <clears throat> I thought just the journey, you know, with, with some of the stories we get to your personal journey, and I never got to hear the, the work, work journey, but um, I'd love to talk about Scribe for a little bit. Um, and when you go in to a company and, you know, like Tucker and his partner founders, you know, they have a humility to be like, listen, we know where our strengths are. We know where we need help. And they bring you in as a CEO. What are the things you do to improve Scribe? Um, you know, the, the, the first thing we talked about it was that author experience. Uh, that that was one of the first things. Uh, the other piece, and this this is very critical for for so many people. Most people, most who are founders, they have a great idea for a product or service. They start that product or service, and they wake up one day and they have seven people working with them, and they think to themselves, "Oh shit, I got a business. I got payroll. I got taxes. I need an income statement. I need a balance sheet." Um, people want healthcare. Wait a minute. I just, I just had a product or service. I didn't know that all this other stuff came with it. And so, so many of your founders, they, they love their idea of their product or service. They never wanted the other aspects that come along with business. I just happen to love the business aspect of it. How do you scale a company? How do you grow a company? The, the culture that comes along with a company. And for me, um, I, I find it very simple. People, process, profits. And with those profits, as a bonus, you can do great things for the communities that you, you live in. So I, I, don't, I, I keep everything very simple for me. You know, my, my, again, off my background, um, I'm not, anything over five is too many. So I boil everything down to three to five, three to five. What are three to five? And so, again, you heard me say people, process, profits. So many companies will get those out of order. So many companies will go like, nope, you got to have a flawless process first, then you hire the people. My argument is you can have a flawless process, but if you have bad people, they will wreck your shit. And so you have great people that can build great process. You can make great profits. And, and I just keep everything real simple. The, the other benefit, I do believe, I've been blessed to find my lane in life, if you will. Uh, coming from the, the chaos I grew up in, I find great peace in business because it is structured. It's very disciplined. It's very routine. You get to pull the levers. Um, and, and I really enjoy that. You know, coming from the chaos I grew up in, Oh, business is, is, dare I say, very therapeutic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that's what I look at when I see a, see a business is, okay, I just start asking questions. But above all, are you putting people first? 
I mean, when I talk to Tucker, he one of the things he said about you was that you're a master of operations and that you were able to, you know, what were some of the the operational pieces that you helped kind of structure with? Like you said, when you met them, I guess they were, you know, maybe about two years into the journey. Man, one of my my favorite moments with with Tucker and Zach, and I said, okay, how how do people pay you? And they said, well, we we take credit card, or or, the, or people write us a check. I said, okay, cool. I said, um, what's the interest rate that you're you're paying for accepting the credit cards? And they they felt real confident, they were like two point nine nine. I was like, okay, great. You know, it could be lower, but that's it's not bad. Um, and then I said this, <laughs> Jeremy, I go, so why don't you have everybody set up on ACH? And they look at me and they're like, but, but literally they go, what the hell is ACH? <laughs> and I go, man, you, you know, you can do all of this for free. Just run the payments through the bank in, in automatic draft where they, that's a thing. And I was like, yeah, that's a thing. So uh, again, you know, two guys, great idea. But like I said, running the business, that's a whole different party. And, and so many, you know, look, look at a lot of your founders out there right now. Even if you want to go to the top of the food chain, uh, the, the Bezos, the Zuckerbergs, the, the Musk, everyone celebrates them. But, okay, they had a great idea. Okay. They, hell, let's, let's pick on Bezos for a second, Jeremy. This is a good one. People will appreciate this. Bezos had a great idea. He's on the floor of his garage, stuffing books in an envelope. He looks over at the, the, the person next to him and he says, you know what would be great if we had knee pads? And the person looks back at him and says, no, if we had tables, that would be great. So they look over in the corner, they see a door and then they put the door on two saw horses. They stand up and that becomes the first uh, table that they worked off of. My point being is everyone celebrates Jeff Bezos. Very few people even know this name when I say it, Jeff Wilkie. Jeff Wilkie was with Jeff Bezos from 1999 through all of the, the, the success that Amazon had. Founders are great. I'm not taking anything from them. But it's never one person that, that makes a great company. It takes a team of people. And, and so for me, back to your point, what people say, well, what's your leadership philosophy? What's your leadership style? I said, okay, it's real simple. Three rules. Surround the company with people far smarter than myself. That's rule number one. Rule number two, surround myself with people far smarter than myself. Rule number three, repeat rules one and two. That's it. I'm done. That's, that's all I got for, for, for leadership. It's uh, I learned a long time ago, the, the goal is not to be the smartest person in the room. The goal is to surround yourself with the smartest people in the room. The goal is to surround, to be able to ask any question that pops in your head and know that someone in this company has the answer. Javon, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks for sharing your story. Everyone check out scribemedia.com. And I can't wait to watch the movie about you where they make that book. And you're like, I don't want anyone to hear it. I just want five people. And then it's going to be a book and eventually it'll be a movie. So um, really, John, much gratitude. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Jeremy, this was great, man. I appreciate you having me on, sir. Thanks, everyone. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand right now. I feel like a hundred grand